morning, people. I hope you're doing well, my delovelies. So, let me show you something good. It may even contain science. Science from space. When I was a kid, I dreamed of being a space doctor, an astrophysician. It was a frustrating dream for a kid to have, mostly because adults assumed I was mispronouncing astrophysicist. But space medicine is an ongoing topic of research, both to take care of our astronauts and to better understand how we could support human health on future long-term space missions to Mars and beyond. Last week, we learned about how your body responds to mechanical forces, but your body does make certain assumptions about those forces. Like for instance, gravity. So, what happens when you change not your body, but the physics around it? We've had some very cool scientific opportunities to address this very question. Back on local news from our universe, we covered possibly the coolest identical twin study in the history of medical science. One twin goes up to space, one twin stays on Earth. How did their gene expression change as a result of being in space? The Kelly twins, Mark and Scott, didn't have identical gene expression before Scott went to space because well, they didn't have identical life experiences, and there's always a little bit of variability between individuals. So in that study, researchers compared a whole host of physical parameters between the twins before, during, and after Scott Kelly's one-year mission to space. That way, they got a baseline between the twins before Scott ever blasted off. When scientists looked at spaceflight-related bone density, cognitive performance, microbiome, and gene regulation, among other things, they found tremendous changes as a result of Scott Kelly's spaceflight. Some factors return to normal within a few weeks of returning to Earth, but others, like cognitive performance, DNA damage, telomere length, and immune regulation, persisted even after six months back on the planet. I should point out one confounding factor in that study's design. Ideally, you'd want to compare one twin who went to space and one twin who'd never been to space. But because Mark and Scott Kelly are excessively cool, both twins had been to space. Both had been part of NASA's space program and Mark, you know, current US senator from Arizona and the Earth twin in this study, had been to space back in the 90s. So this study may be a bit imperfect, but only because the Kelly twins are too freaking cool. The data set from the NASA twin study had space medicine researchers beastin' and feastin'. We know this and this and this change in space, but why? After which, those researchers proceeded to nerd out discovering the mechanisms that drive space physiology. And while that study's a gold mine, it's hardly the last time scientists did a before and after health check on astronauts to learn about the effects of space. So today we're gonna talk about a recently published study that looks at further changes to the human body under space and space-like conditions to tease out how and why these changes occur. See, there's more than one environmental difference between Earth and space. I know, shocking. Microgravity and the bad hair day that accompanies it is a pretty obvious one, but another big difference is exposure to ionizing radiation. Shielded though the International Space Station is, astronauts who spend time up there get more than their fair dose of ionizing radiation, so space medicine researchers have a problem. In order to address the physiological changes induced by spaceflight, you first gotta know which space thing is causing which problem. Of course, sometimes there's a pretty intuitive answer for why is space causing this change in the human body? Take DNA damage for a start. As we discussed with the dogs of Chernobyl, ionizing radiation causes DNA damage that isn't easy for our cells to repair. We can handle a certain amount of single strand breaks in our DNA, but when ionizing radiation causes a double strand break, 
that's beyond our cell's pay grade most of the time. So when we see the DNA damage Scott Kelly accumulated from his year in space, we can take an educated guess as to the cause. Doesn't mean we don't need to confirm. In science, we actually prove our hypotheses, but we have a good idea of where to look. Likewise, sometimes we can take a pretty good guess that microgravity is the culprit. It's hard to lift weights in space, what with the microgravity and all. So let's take a guess about what's causing muscle atrophy in space. And since even land-dwelling folks have a use it or lose it to building muscle, we've got to confirm, but once again, we have a hint as to the right direction, even if radiation may also play some part. Then there's a third category, which is, uh, um, what the heck? And that brings us at last to our space medicine study of the day published in Scientific Advances. When Scott Kelly was up in space, he became the first astronaut to get a vaccination. Flu shot, in case you're curious. Remember when I said one of the findings in his comparison study with his brother was a difference in immune regulation? Well, his memory T cells reacted as expected to the vaccine, but a whole bunch of other T cell related parameters had changed. In fact, there were changes across all immune cell types, as well as a notable response from inflammatory signaling molecule cytokines. And at the same time, about half the crew members way back from the Apollo missions reported bacterial or viral infections after returning to Earth. So what gives? What's space doing to our immune systems? And more importantly, what about space is doing this? Radiation? Microgravity? Isolation? All of the above? How do our researchers go about teasing apart these tangled strings? In this case, our researchers leverage an imperfect model perfectly. You may have heard of those, NASA will pay you thousands of dollars to stay in bed for science experiments. Those experiments are intended to simulate the effects of microgravity, but as we've just learned, simulated microgravity alone is an imperfect proxy for space because variables like ionizing radiation don't come into play. And for obvious ethical reasons, NASA will not be offering any number of dollars to expose you to medically unnecessary ionizing radiation. But we're trying to figure out what microgravity does to your immune system in space, so these simulations are perfect for figuring out what the heck microgravity is doing to our T cells. This study used dry immersion beds where you're immersed down to your neck in a water bath, but you're in a waterproof suit, so you're not actually like turning into a prune for the weeks you're part of the study. Unlike more traditional lie down in bed, type studies, this dry immersion technique gets simulated microgravity results much faster, which makes sense because water float. And indeed, within three weeks, our researchers saw changes to the volunteers' T cells, uh, changes that affect proliferation and differentiation, that is signaling for we're going to need more of these and we need this kind of T cell, respectively, as well as T cell activation. And lo and behold, those changes both corresponded to Scott Kelly's results and, like Kelly's, persisted in the week after volunteers stopped dry immersion, much in the same way Kelly's immune changes lingered for months after he returned to Earth. In aggregate, these changes made T cells a little less effective at fighting off infections, potentially explaining the infections experienced by the returning Apollo astronauts as well. It may seem a little weird at first that microgravity could affect your immune cells. Like, we can kind of understand why bone cells might be mechanosensitive, as we discussed last week. But why the heck would your immune cells care about the physics around them? Well, that same mechanosensitive ion channel they put into insulin-producing cells in last week's episode, piezo one T cells have it too. Rather than respond to pulling a longbow or playing queen, T 
cells are affected by changes in blood flow. And blood flow glo goes a little wonky when it doesn't have gravity, to keep it honest. In fact, a lot of immune cells have PSO1 to sense fluid shear stress from blood flow, as do blood vessel cells themselves, which co-regulate the immune system. So, future studies may investigate just how many spaceflight-related immune changes can be explained by cells that can tell you've changed the physics around them and don't like it. Space is pretty hard on a human body that never adapted to any of that nonsense. And these findings are another step toward making our astronauts' experience healthier so they can properly enjoy being in freaking space. And with any luck, we'll find ways that help support the human body to stay in space for longer periods of time so that we can eventually travel through the big black. But these studies also help humans on Earth. Microgravity is an extreme, but the more we understand how those mechanisms are affected, the better we can target treatments for people who have similar issues due to enforced inactivity, aging-related changes in blood flow, and so on. So often we hear things like, why are you studying space when we have all these problems here on Earth? And over and over again, we find that studying space does help us understand problems here on Earth. Materials for spacecraft with useful applications on the ground, computer algorithms invented for astronomical data analysis that can be put to other uses. And in this case, a deeper understanding of the human body and what the physics it needs from us. Forget the adults. Astrophysician is where it's at. <laughs>